All right. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Um, yeah, so welcome to what is this? Class six. Five, six. Yeah, class six. Holy cow. So starting next week is our final big project where we'll be uh, working on a, a big new painting. So I'm excited for that. And uh, I was out at the vineyards all weekend um, helping with the workshop and uh, got lots of cool photos and I'm contemplating <laughs> changing up the image again um, for my final projects. I got a very, very dramatic uh, cloud painting here of the vineyards and it's, uh, of course I shot it through my sunglasses. So let's do a screen share and show you what I'm talking about. Uh, Photoshop. There we go. You guys see this big guy here? Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. So that's um, Montenor Vineyard out in Forest Grove. And I was just driving away, spent the day actually painting um, on the other side of that hill towards the sun. Um, and uh, as I was driving away, I caught this photo and I thought, you know what? This is complicated enough and simple enough that I think it could warrant a final project and it has a lot of options of zooming in and you know different edits we can do um anyways would you guys be interested in doing that for those that you can, you're more than welcome to of course do any scene that you choose but I kind of thought this might be a fun one because it's doing a lot of everything that we talked about it's got the fog and yep please. did you say did you say large well, I'm thinking like 16 by 20 size, maybe, uh -huh. um, but you're any size. I mean, I could even do it bigger than that. Um, just kind of more of a finalized finished product because we've been doing a lot of exercises and we'll do a couple today as well. Um, and then I think that this kind of leads us, you know, something final that we hopefully is nice enough that we want to hang on our walls or something like that. I like to usually finish the classes with, um, kind of a something that incorporates much of what we've learned so right. um, I know I presented the other one with the trees and the you know the cool blue colors but I kind of like this one but I always like whatever's new too so maybe next week I'll have something else that I like so what is in this? The, oh, I was gonna uh, say what is in the middle foreground yeah right that what is this a that's just some yellow flowers. I would probably get Oh, no, no, no. The the block that comes over from the right, yes. That's that. a vineyard. Those are vines. Oh, uh -huh. it's hard to tell. Okay, got it. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yummy. Okay. I'm worried about, about my own ability to um, differentiate that. I mean, it'd be a good exercise, but I don't know for myself if I might have a hard time making that look beautiful in comparison to the rest of it but I guess that's where the editing comes in right sure yeah I mean we could make it not such a block shape too um you know if you wanted to make it more of an interesting shape just by simply well and it comes and, right over to the middle too. and then what's what's that brown streak on the left is that a a clearing or a ditch or a <laughs> Yeah, that's just a dry grass field. Um, so yeah, okay. There's, okay. there's opportunities for improvement. <laughs> Verification. <laughs> yeah, um, what if we did even something like... Oh my gosh. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I love it. Um, and so you shot this through your sunglasses, you say? Yeah, I do it all the what, time. What, what did you use for a camera? My iPhone. No kidding. And are, are your sunglasses <laughs> polarized? I yeah, love it. They're, they're polarized and they're prescription, so it kind of messes with the camera. Oh my gosh, you're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and they were probably really dirty because I'd been out painting all day, so. Oh my. Wow. We can choose our I know <laughs> every time I try and get a nice sunset view, the, the sun just wipes out everything else and it just comes out yeah, too light. I'll usually tap into the sun area a little bit so it doesn't wash it out completely. Anyways, that was yeah. just an idea. 
Um, we can still decide, and everybody's welcome to do, of course, whatever they want. Um, but yeah, you're right. There's definitely issues here. Like that's what I would try to figure out, you know, okay, like these yellow flowers up front are very disruptive. I do like the shadow across the front, but probably not so much. So, you know, maybe it's more of a scene like. Uh -huh. Kind of like that or something. Um, I don't know. And I love I clouds too, so. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, anyways, um, start thinking about what picture you might want to paint for your final painting. So that's next week. And, you know, nobody has to paint along with me. If they don't want. Um, but but anyways, wait, when, is, when is our final painting due? When is it due? <laughs> is that like the following week? So we have two weeks. Yeah, so we'll work on it. We start now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you could, yeah why not? I'll, I'll, let's talk about that um, towards the end of class a little bit. Okay. Um, for the next class, uh, starting in January, I did uh, go ahead and submit the class details to OSA, Oregon Society of Artists, and um, it is going to be color and color theory. We're going to touch on that today, but you know, we're we're doing color through a tonalist point of view today. Um, starting next January, it would be a um, full color theory and uh, playing with color and doing a couple different experiments using different color wheels, different color theories, and um, learning about, yeah, having fun with color anyways. So hopefully everybody will be down for that and hopefully that will help answer a lot of questions that we weren't really able to get to um, this time around. And um, I'm gonna go ahead so here's how the day is going to go. We are today we are discussing um, kind of emotionally painted or poetically painted tonalism versus the more uh, early historic tonalism that is more academic and design and um, technically um, oriented. And so today we're going to be getting a little more expressive a little more abstracted, if you will, um, just letting our brushes have a little more fun. So it could be a little messier feeling for some of us, um, but it's just something I want you to experiment. And while we're doing that, we're going to be learning about color keys. Remember last week we did value keys, the lights and the darks, and where they lie on the value scale. Today, we're gonna be doing color keys. Um, I don't have the same uh, metaphor or whatever of a piano, really, because it's, you know, where does it lie on the color wheel, the reds, the yellows, the blues, or anywhere in between. Um, and we're also dealing with temperature keys. So the warms, you know, the warmer colors, I don't know where I'm pointing, <laughs> warmer co <laughs> the warmer colors the cooler colors um, and the different keys that the paintings can be in. So uh, I'm gonna jump up to the easel and I'm just gonna paint the same design twice. Very, uh, very simple, very easy to follow along design if you wanna use it. Um, it'll be basically three, maybe four values. It's gonna be my generic creek and a couple trees and that's it. I'm going to paint it with acrylic paint, black and white and gray. And I'm going to then, while that is drying, I'm going to step back over here to the computer. And we are going to look at um, a number of artists' paintings. I posted them all already on Facebook um, in a new, um, new folder under the media section. I think it's just called Cool and Color Keys and Warm and Cool Keys. Um, so you can look there or I will be showing them on Facebook and we're going to analyze how these artists are using these different um, theories, whether or not they're even aware of it, but uh, and how they're creating tonalist pieces using that. And hopefully during that time, my acrylics will get nice and dry and I'm going to jump back up on the easel and color those two paintings up using oil paints. And I'm going to show a monochrome 
color, which is the easiest way to uh, make a very harmonious painting. And then we're gonna mix our other colors using more of a color and temperature key. That makes sense. That's a lot, but that's what, well, something just fell in my studio. Um, <laughs> there's not even a cat in here. Um, so anyways, we will have a bit of jumping around. Your homework this week is to do um, basically a warm and a cool small painting. And you can use whichever of the color theories if you want to do like a monochrome or if you want to do like, I'll do another one where I'll mix the colors more. And with the monochrome, it's so simple. I'm going to simply use, pick a color and I'm going to add black or white to it. It's just that simple and you can make some really beautiful scenes that way um, and then we may even go back into that one and add more color if it's too boring or whatever else but uh, I wanted to show you that so anyways let's jump over to all right good my uh my easel and you can see I've uh I gessoed a couple of canvases this morning uh, one white, one gray. The white one is the one I'm going to preserve for doing the um, monochromatic. And the gray one I will do with the uh, mixed colors. But really quickly, I'm just going to go up and sketch, um, like I said, a three to four value painting really quickly. And it's going to be very simplistic. And we can make it as exciting or as simple as we want. I'll zoom in the snake a little bit. And again, I not was not able to get the zoom and the, the remote for some reason is not communicating with the, uh, with the camera. So I apologize for that. Um, so it's just gonna be me moving the camera up and back. I've got my clear plate here. You can barely see it, visible plate. I'm just gonna squeeze out a bit of black and I'm gonna try a different type of acrylic paint this time, just on our ever uh, expanding search to see what acrylics work best for underpaintings for me. Um, this is a Blick Artist Acrylic Series One. I think they're all series one colors. So I'm gonna squeeze out some black and some white. Just that simple. I actually put out Payne's Gray because I've never used Payne's Gray in acrylic just to see what that does a little bit. So there we go. Um, would you guys prefer to see? It's going to be a little bit hard to see the whole, everything with the small. So I'm just going to kind of leave that up there. And you guys understand mixing values with just black and white. So as I'm coming up there with my colors or my values, you'll be able to tell what's going on. Um, and Michael, as you paint with those acrylics, especially since you've put the paints gray in the mix, um, let us know what colors you're seeing on your canvas because we're of course seeing sure, the I'm digital version. Guess, I'm gonna guess that my gray will be a little bluer. It looks very blue. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Pretty much matches. I just lost you, Mike. Oh, there you are. You're back. Okay, cool. I just love Payne's Gray. Yeah, I really like it too. And we'll just see what happens. I've never used it for this idea. Um, so basically, I'm just going to show you in a couple quick strokes a very simple design that I can play with and use, because I don't want to worry too much about making a masterpiece design and getting my values, because I just, today is not about that. Today is about the colors and temperatures and having fun with my brushwork. So my first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in a horizon line, basically about one third of the way to the top. All right. I'm going to have a creek kind of coming from the bottom of the painting. And it's going to roll up to about two thirds of the way up on this scene. 
And it's going to turn back here. So it's going to. Just like that, we have a creek. <laughs> Same thing with this guy. Just kind of pick an anchor point and basically just let it get a little messy as it goes back there. I'm using, not only am I using a shop brush, I'm using a really poor one, small, a bad, this one's in bad shape, it's a half inch. And I just grabbed a bunch of, um, random brushes for use with acrylics. I don't mix my acrylic and my oil brushes as a general rule. All right, so there's one, two, three shapes. One, two, three shapes. Let's add a couple more shapes. I'm gonna put kind of a tree in front of the creek. So the creek's kind of gonna be rolling behind it here. That's gonna be my biggest tree. So that's the base of it. And I'm just gonna make it nice and simple and kind of roundish. Going off the top of my scene, but it's really got some nice foreground. Let's go ahead and fill that in. I'm gonna use pretty dark paint to fill it in, just so you can see it. All right, so that's a tree. <laughs> All right, so now I've got four shapes, still nice and simple. Michael, I don't know if there's some way you can pin yourself. Um, oh, sorry, I totally forgot to do that. Thank you. Sorry about that. And also, it's really helpful if everyone generally keeps their mics closed because it uh, then we won't hear the noises. All right, there we go. Spotlight for everybody. Did that help? Go ahead and talk to somebody, see if the screen goes away. One, yeah, two, thanks. Three. All right, great. All right. It's interesting how that same color looks so different because of the background. Yeah, it is. It's pretty wild. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and add another tree a little further back. I'm just going to give it, it's going to be on the other side of the creek, and it's going to be peeking back kind of from behind. Maybe I'll lower it just a little more than that. Peeking from behind this tree, it's going to be slightly lighter in color. And All right, so now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six shapes going on kind of we split up. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add some trees way back there kind of right on the horizon line. Um, they're a little lighter even again. I can make them big and or you know as complicated or as simple as I want. Again, I apologize that this is such a rudimentary scene, but it's nice to have something that you can kind of just make quickly when you want to experiment with other things, colors, temperatures. Um, we're still retaining kind of a value, uh, a value going on here. Differentiation, let's go ahead and put in our ground plane in this one here. And it's just going to kind of be some marshy grasses. Scrub, scrub, scrub. Just getting some paint on there. The cool thing is, too, is if I decide to keep working on this, like, oh, man, there's actually something interesting going on there. 
I can come back in and refine it either with the acrylics or with the colors when I'm adding my colors and temperature shifts, working on the color keys and the temperature keys. All right. I think this little tree way back here. Give it oops, too dark. I'm gonna go ahead and darken the bases just a little bit so that they are different from the ground cup uh, value that I put in there. And I'm gonna darken the bases of these trees as well. And now I'm just gonna start to let some of the texture show through. So I'm just kind of letting the brush dance a little bit. I could use different brushes. I even brought up like a sponge or, you know, you could use a finer edged brush if you kind of knew what you wanted to um, bring out detail wise, you know, maybe it's maybe I let the creek turn back here again. Maybe it goes off this way a little bit. And let's go ahead and lighten this land way back here a little bit. So that we get a little bit of a sense of atmosphere and depth on the ground plane itself. poke maybe a little couple holes in here so it's a little more interesting. Get back to my messy brush and let's uh, bring in kind of a feeling of um, messy grass edges and give this grass a little bit of height to it. Um, you know, and I could have been fine with just where I was, but I want to have a little bit of texture. Have you established the direction of the light? No, thank you. That's no, not at all. Right now, it's just the very simple kind of values, like we talked about. Um, was that in the first or second class about just kind of uprights versus flat planes um, versus the sky versus the water? Right. We've got value one, value two, three, and four. Um, yeah, we'll have to establish our, especially when we bring in our colors, because that's where the detail and more of the information will probably come in is when we're adding in the just kind of having fun, letting the brush do most of the work for me, do the heavy lifting. As far as texture and stuff, you know, you can use whatever tools you want, um, have fun, experiment with different mark making. Um, and again, you can make this as tight or as uh, loose as you want. I'm going to go ahead and add white paint. I 
white or light acrylic paint into my sky and water really quick. Now let's decide where should I have my light source just because now I'm dealing with the sky and the water a little more. Where do you guys, where would you guys like to see some light coming through? It looks to me like upper left would be logical. Upper left behind the tree? Mm, yeah, not, yeah. Okay. Sounds logical to me. It's dark in this side of the sky a little bit. This is, this is kind of like improv painting where you say, give me a light source. Yeah, exactly. Give me a theme, yeah. Potato famine and... <laughs> I'm just darkening so that I can come back in and lighten it, which is kind of funny. The other thing is I like how these colors kind of come up against the others and add um, some more interesting kind of brushwork. All right, let's lighten that sky on the left side, kind of behind this tree maybe, kind of coming out here. Sure, put a lot of paint on there. Let's see, I'm gonna need a new brush. Go ahead and grab a brush that has a little control, just kind of a more normal, typical brush. are getting a little weird and boring over here. Pop back in. I did forget my shadow of the tree or reflect dark reflection of the tree up above. So let's kind of bring some of that down. Can you review kind of any rules for reflections? Uh, generally, um, reflections are a little bit lighter, like in the darks, and a little bit darker in the lights. And reflect reflections generally just come straight down towards us. And so as far as like how far back um, something would get into the water or into the reflection? Yeah. So oftentimes, what I'll do is even kind of measure it either to the horizon line. So if I was measuring, like, where's that light? I'd measure it from the horizon line. And so, the, you know, the sun would be pretty much right about here behind this grass. So that's why I kind of have it coming off, you know, over here. Um, the tree, I would just kind of take from, let me show you something so it's a little easier to see what I'm doing here. So if I measure this tree back here, this kind of mid-range one, from the top to the bottom, it's approximately this tall. And this is when you're standing eye level at things. And then I would just go from the base of it to the bottom. So it really doesn't show up in this reflection at all. It's kind of right, it would probably be ending right by those grasses. And then, so I go from the top, I don't know where the top of that tree is. Let's just pretend it's that tall to the bottom. And then again, from the bottom of the tree. So we'd see lots of that one reflecting in theory, and that's just kind of a quick cheating way that, you know, it's not probably super, super scientific, um, but it's convincing. If you just measure everything from the horizon line, it doesn't work. Um, and a lot of times people, you know, have a mountain way back here, and then you'll see it down here, but it wouldn't probably be like that. Um, So, Michael, I have a question about the shadow of the big tree. Um, would that come all the way across the water as well, or? Well, I mean, I'm just going to go. And I see. mean, the, the shadow on it that's 
from the sun? I mean, where oh, would the shadow? Back here, yeah, it would be casting, you know, I guess the light would be kind of behind this tree. So it'd be, you know, kind of coming at this angle. Okay, okay. Yeah. And again, I'm just oops, trying to keep it a little simpler than all Good. of that, but you're more than welcome to get as, you know, uh, into the weeds with the science of everything and all that. Um, but yeah, it, that's a good point though, is remember the difference between a shadow and a reflection. I see that a lot where people mistakenly will put like shadows and uh, we'll be adding the colors of the thing and that's more like a reflection. Um, so the, you know, shadow is just darker on the ground plane. It's just a darkening of whatever the shadow is rolling across. So if my grasses were yellows, reds, and greens, and the shadow was coming across here, um, then it's just yellow or darker yellows, greens, and reds, whatever colors are there. It doesn't have anything to do with the color of the tree itself. All right, I think that's kind of okay for that one. We'll just, maybe I can bring in a couple highlights of grasses like they're, they are picking up. Oh. Just getting a little bit of texture is all. Hinting at detail. All right, let's go back to this guy. Same thing. Let's get these uh, bases a little darker. Let's get in here and make some more expressive fun brush work. This time I remembered to put the shadow in or the reflection, sorry, of the big tree coming down. I just love those weird little marks, even though I'm going to go over them with uh, different values here in a little bit. I just kind of like having just this kind of messy free flowing texture that's kind of develops itself on there and I can you know use it disregard it I can cover it um, but I like the organicness of that I mean it's really interesting kind of calligraphy um, you know and you can try to control it as much as you want or you can really get crazy with it and just uh, use it um, you know and I've seen that in a number of your guys' little sketches that some of them you really let it go and have fun and other ones you know other people probably got freaked out by the use of a shop brush with its lack of control and everything else um i'm gonna go ahead and go jump up to my sky because i've already got kind of a valued ground plane, which it doesn't look like. It's funny now, this all appears really light. Um, and I put the sun kind of in the same spot there. Of a light source. Really reading out is um, or it's a little bit hard to see on the monitor there. And let's add a little more texture kind of into the ground plane. It's interesting though, right? I mean, it kind of looks like I've gone in and added a lot of detail. It's just kind of an implied detail through uh, messiness, I guess. 
Um, you're seeing the different kind of values. And again, this may not be for everybody. You're totally welcome to use whatever tools for this are you know, fun for you, are comfortable for you, or that you want to experiment with. Um, I'm just trying to get something on here really quickly so that we've got something to add color and uh, temperature keys in a little bit here. So I just want it to get on there quick and dry so that we can come back in and paint it after we've looked at how other artists are using their color and temperature keys to make their harmonious tonalist paintings. Okay. Maybe I'll even add a couple like pretending like there's some white flowers in here or something. tops of grasses or something a little lighter. That might be stupid, I don't know. Might have to take all that out later. Kind of a little bit of lights catching the tops of these grasses. I forgot to kind of, if the, my light's kind of behind these trees, it's probably picking up on the grasses as well. So maybe I'll lighten up the, the ground plane even a touch more back there a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and take my palette knife and I put this white on back here really thickly and I just remember that I need that to dry. So I'm just going to take my palette knife and uh, skim it across and pull off kind of the extra paint. If I, you know, was going to let it dry overnight or, you know, for hours, it wouldn't matter, but I'm hoping to get back to this sooner than later. I'm also just looking for hard edges where I don't think hard edges should be. And let's go ahead and lighten. Oops, this brush is dirty. All my brushes are dirty. Back to the sponge or to the sponge. I don't know if when you guys, if you guys used to watch Bob Ross paint every once in a while, and it used to amaze me that he would pull out these sponge things like we had in kindergarten and make paintings with them. Um, and one of the cool things that he would use them for would be edges like on barns and different things like that. Um, but I remember him also putting in uh, like trunks really quickly with them. Um, ah, got a little fat there at the bottom. I don't want it to be quite that fat. So that was not a good example. Let's now they're trees. Now they're trees. Yeah. Let's just, I'm going to pretend, see if I can put in just a couple of trunks. He's practiced at it. I want my trunks to appear a little bit wider at the bottom. 
there we go. You can kind of see back there. I don't want them perfect, so kind of obliterate them a little bit, obliterate their edges. Come back in with some lights to do the inverse, kind of the holes in the trees a little bit. Kind of thinning out some of the branches. A little more lights getting through them. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting crazy. I already know I am. Getting a little silly with it. Anyways, very, very basic. You can make it as complicated. You can work the scene up as much or as little as you want. Um, I think that that's, you know, a decent something to put some colors on and to play with and experiment. And uh, yeah, anything glaringly wrong before I put my acrylics brushes in the water so they don't dry up. And I come back over to the computer. Anything that you see that doesn't read at all. Oh, this black spot, dark spot here is a little weird on the monitor. So I'm just going to bring would, it. Would there be any shadows on the foreground land uh, where the big tree is or the middle tree? Yeah, let's go ahead and add that. So I'm going to pretend my son is right on the basically behind this tree here. So it's kind of coming down. So I'm just going to go ahead and darken a little bit underneath. I think that right hand example, that tree that you went over with the brush, it's too dark now because it's almost as dark as the foreground one. There. Voila. Voila. Good catch. Good Very good. Kind of fun working on two paintings at once. I can just kind of flap back and forth when I think I got a value that's kind of working. And you notice that my white. I have to go ahead and clean a brush. My white in here got a little bit dirty, so I'm just going to go ahead and brighten that before we stop. Um, anyways, so, you know, just coming up with any kind of design, creeks are kind of my thing, um, my favorite. I look at them all the time. You know, I can't hardly drive over a bridge without craning my neck to see what the creek might look like down below. Um, I'm probably not the safest thing when driving. Um, but, uh, you know, whatever it is, if it was just a simple farm field, uh, whatever it is that you want to do, but it's just something that I can go to really quickly and experiment with and, um, and try, you know, when I don't want to think so, so, so much about the scene, I don't want to spend all my time just, uh, coming up with an idea and everything else. I could just quickly go to my creek scene in my head, make something up really fast and uh, move on. I hope you're probably like, yeah, I hear you. Move on. Let's be done with this. Um, I just want it to be good. <laughs> 
Is there something you do when you start to feel impatient with a painting to, to not feel impatient about it? Uh, when I'm teaching, it's a lot harder um, because I'm impatient because I want to value your time. And I want to get to all the different things I want to cover, which as always is far too much to fit in a three hour class. Um, I know one or two of you are asking, is there going to be like a tonalism two class? And there's so much to cover. It's funny, like the more I look through my notes and the more I read and the more I review about the paintings of others, the more you just go, oh man, I could, I could cover that. Oh, I could cover that. Um, so yeah, there's just so much and I just get so excited by it all. And I know you guys do too. And so, um, but yeah, I will take, I, I, I oftentimes, I talked about it a little bit last week about just taking that deep breath. I have a, a six count in, three count or two to three count hold and an eight count out. And I basically will just kind of in my head just say, I am here now. <laughs> and that grounds me um, or it helps to ground me and to slow me down. And especially if I'm getting distracted by things, um, it's easy to get distracted, you know, with your computer in here, your phone, everything else. And so trying to just stay present with the painting. I mean, again, I know that all sounds kind of strange, but um, it is important for me to be aware because I can be just like everybody else. I can just kind of go into autopilot a little bit where I'm just dab, 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 dab. And I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing and how I'm building up the surface of the painting. And uh, I can get myself in a lot of trouble. It's funny how all of a sudden you can kind of come to and you're like, oh, my God, I've been painting. And oh, look at this mess I've made by just. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't even know what I was doing. It's like when you read like when you're reading a book. And there's a really interesting sentence, but your brain, your eyes keep reading, but your brain is concentrating on what you read already. You guys ever have that happen to you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you realize I've just read this whole page and I only I was thinking about the first thing it said um, that happens with me with painting, too, sometimes. So, yeah, trying to come back, trying to be with the painting, be in that moment is harder. Harder to do than it seems like you would. It seems like painting very much instinctually just wants to it, it, you should be in the moment, but. Um, so, Michael, now that you've thrown out the Tonalism 2 class tease, are you are you thinking about it seriously? Um, yeah, but I, the only problem with when I do stuff like that is that I won't get new students. It'll be half of the old students that are, you know, yeah, that sounds interesting. The other half are like, no, nah, I've had enough Tonalism. Um, and so I, I diminish my class size. And that's just an economics thing at that point. So I apologize. But what I may do is um, another just tonalism class and, you know, take some of just teach some different information and repeat some of the same information and we'll go into. Um, so I've got a number of students, Michelle, Denise, Gail, Carrie, uh, Susan, actually, most of you guys have been with me a number of times and you know that I repeat myself, right? And then I go over a lot of the information again and again, and that would be the same with tonalism. But every time, hopefully, your brain is picking up new information you're, and I'm presenting things slightly differently, um, both for my own sanity and for yours. And, um, and then I'm also just hoping that the students are challenging themselves at the level they're at. That's why, you know what I mean? It's um, I expect, you know, Denise to be painting differently than Jean and Soli and Michelle. Everybody's painting differently and they're all chasing different things. They're all, everybody's, you know, doing their own uh, thing. And um, hopefully with that, that if I did teach another tonalist class, I don't think I would call it tonalism two. Maybe I would uh, advertise it to you guys kind of as tonalism too, but there would be some repetition so I could have um, more students hopefully join us. Um, not more than we have now, but I would lose some, you know, I've always got to be kind of thinking about that. Or um, raise the price. 
raise the price, huh? Okay. Um, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I know, I'll raise uh, it on a curve. If I get half the students, I got to <laughs> double the price. If I get one third the students. Well, okay. <laughs> it, whatever would economically work. No, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. I, I, I definitely loved teaching this class. Um, and if you take like my design core class, um, which I think I'll probably do in the fall because that's normally what I would do now, you can very much, we'll take the color class too, I hope, because you'll learn a lot about how to make the tertiary colors and the colors that exist in the middle of the color wheel that are all the beautiful browns and grays and everything else. Um, Absolutely, I'll sign up for sure. And, uh, you know, repetition is good, especially the older you get. So nothing wrong with just calling it tonalism. I'm just teasing. No, I appreciate it. And I'm glad that you like this class so much that you're willing to pay three times as much. Um, <laughs> Uh, just kidding. Um, but anyways, I do appreciate that. I take it as a compliment. And um, yeah, I hope we can. I think we'll take kind of a review at the end and uh, see what everybody thought. But maybe we'll revisit it next fall again and uh, have a great time. And then the other classes that I teach, you can always just say, hey, Mike, I'm leaning towards tonalism on all of these. And I will be able to give you tools and techniques and things where you can bring, even if I'm teaching you um, uh, complementary colors, you know, the two colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel, I absolutely will do um, tonalist color, colors like that. And in fact, I may even teach a little bit about that today um, for the second of the paintings. Yes, Jean, I see your hand. I was just gonna say that your classes are just so good that you can apply them to any the theories or the skills to any medium. Right, thank you. That's exactly yeah. how I'm hoping. And that's that's what I, 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 even when I'm, I mean, I'm focusing on landscapes just because I'm demoing landscapes most of the time. But yeah, all of these things that we've learned this year, all of it is applicable to uh, portraiture or still life or cats or cars or whatever it is you wanna paint. Um, and I'm always weirded out when people are say like, oh, I'm taking a cat painting class and I've got a cat painting color palette and I've got my cat painting paint brushes. Um, I just don't think of painting like that. I think all of it's for everything. Um, you know, some of it with like the color, how do the four values go across the landscape? Of course, that's a little more, um, per particular, but that's also going to be really helpful if you want to put a landscape behind your cat um, <laughs> painting. Um, anyways, enough cats. Let's, do you, I, do you guys have any questions about why I just did what I did up there with the black and white and gray scale paintings? Was that straightforward enough? What my intention is for that here in about a half hour? Yes. Great. All right. I'm going to do screen share. And I'm gonna take you to Photoshop. If you have the ability and wanna see the pictures bigger, you could visit them on Facebook and maybe you can do that afterwards. Um, what I'm gonna talk about though is, um, we're gonna look at three different aspects. Let's go to screen share and go to Photoshop. All right, who remembers what it is that today's class is focusing on? Go ahead, Gail. No, Gail doesn't know. All right. Aesthetic Warm. versus expressive tonalism. Yeah, perfect. That's one of three. What else do we got? Go ahead, Michelle. Um, oh, let's see. Color keys and temperature keys. All right. Those are the other two. Nailed them all at once. So color key is, um, I should have had a color wheel on here. You guys can all picture a color wheel or I can just do stop share real quick. Let's go to color key really quick. Um, a color key would basically be just, you know, it's a dominant one of these colors, right? So if we're saying color key, you know, is the painting orange or tip, you know, and just, it's kind of like predominantly is it, you know, 60%, 70% leaning towards one color, or are they using more of like the first painting we're going to see here in just a second by Charles Melville? Is it more of just my gosh, it's so hard to look at backwards or do it all backwards. Um, is it, it's just in the warm side. So it's <laughs> uh, these colors, right? That's, 
the warm keys of the painting. And then the color keys are going to be, <laughs> gosh, it's going to make my brain explode trying to do it backwards. Um, is the color keys are here. And then you'll see in it that it's going to lean towards green. It's going to go across the color wheel a little bit. So the color key would be kind of a pizza slice from the yellow orange to the warmer red leaning towards green. So that's kind of the color key. And then the temperature key is going to be on the warmer side. Okay. Here's what I want us to, and this is the advanced part of this lesson. I'm just going to throw it out there, but we're going to teach, a, learn a lot more about it in color is no colors by themselves are intrinsically warm or cool. Okay. When we are taught in college and when we're taught when we're young, warm colors and cool colors, they literally just split the color wheel in half and tell you these are the warm colors and these are the cool colors. That's fine as a very basic fundamental understanding of it. But the truth is all colors can be warm and all colors can be cool. It's always comparative to what they're around and what else is in the scene. Okay. So we will talk about that as well. Remember, that's kind of the advanced setting of this for our very beginning idea of it. It's just kind of the warm, warmer colors, the reds and yellows, and maybe the warmer greens. Um, you know, and then we can think, well, purples are warmer than blues because they've got red in them, but they're definitely cooler than red, right? And just like pink is generally cooler than red because white also cools colors down. You guys have all had that happen to you in your paintings. You're like, oh, I can't wait to put in this bright pink, you know, on this flower. And you go and all of a sudden what happens, you add your white to your red and it just cools way down and it's so sad. And we'll talk a little bit about that. All right, back to Photoshop. All right, everybody seeing Photoshop and Charles Melville Dewey here. Um, I used to be able to just show one picture at a time and it would black out all the other ones. And I've either forgotten how to do it or I can't, I can't, I don't have that option any longer. I used to be able to black out. So we're gonna have to ignore the paintings that are behind it. Um, all right, so. How about at the top where it has that box next to the red X? Red X. On yeah. your oh yeah i can make it gray perfect thank you that's that's a very nice and easy way to do it all right great so we've got uh charles melville dewey d-e-w-e-y um awesome painter i love his like little um trees and how he gets these little spindly branches and i really look at his work to kind of see how he groups and simplifies big shapes and then he just has just enough information kind of sticking off the sides oftentimes to tell you what's going on and add a little bit of character. Um, but let's forget about that part of it. And let's think about, and I did brighten this a little bit just because it was really dark. Um, there it is, there's a little bit brighter. Um, that's a little too bright maybe. Anyways, what do you think we're dealing with here? Is it a warm or a cool kind of general um, in the warm or the cool key? Warm, warm, warm. And I'm, I don't think I'm going to have to go over that too, too much because it becomes pretty obvious in most tonalist paintings. Um, and a lot of them will have some of both, right? I like to use both. Um, but it's just kind of like, what's the overarching color? Even in his shadows, his colors are even are staying quite warm. Um, all right. And then what is our color key is primarily kind of this earthy brown red with a little bit of green and some yellow. Um, a lot of times I like to do, um, let's see if I can, how would I do it on here? Let's just pick a little, I know what I'll do. I'm gonna do a little dropper and we're gonna pick some colors here. It's kind of the generic big, big colors of the painting. My daughter loves doing this. She loves analyzing paintings and figuring out their color schemes. 
and making these cool little bars down the sides of them. And she then she'll use those colors if she really likes them. And it's a great way to kind of see the big relationships in the colors or in the painting that the artist is using. And let's get a slightly brighter green in there. This is a little time consuming way to do this. So I'm not gonna do this on very many paintings, but I just wanna show you that you can kind of, you can, you know, there's our color scheme, right? Basically that's if, you know, if you kind of took this painting into um, Home Depot and said, I would like to use these colors in my house. You know, you bought a Mike Orwick painting and you got it up over your mantle and you decided, oh man, it's so beautiful. I need to rearrange everything in my dining room and uh, uh, how do I match it? So I love doing this as well. And I love uh, seeing my daughter do it. And it's just really nice to see, oh, look at that harmony. You know, it's got very different colors that they all lean towards. Even this green is really quite reddish. And this red is quite reddish. Like if I put a square over the top of it of green and I picked out a much more greeny green, right? That color hardly even looks green anymore. Oh, oh wow. Right, if I did the same thing with this yellow up here. So for those of us who don't have Photoshop, how are we going to apply this? Cut up some pictures. No, um, <laughs> you are going to do it by, you can just take a piece of paper and, you know, or a couple pieces of paper and you can analyze the colors. But the main thing I'm trying to show you is the, uh, um, that they just, that the, how Harmony is working in their paintings. It's hard to find a real those, yellow. Those, um, the values are pretty close on the three darker ones. They are, aren't they? Yeah, so he's letting the color do the separating within the values. That's great, yeah. Now you'll see me doing that a lot in my darks and in my shadows, that my values stay very similar, but I do allow the colors and the temperatures to shift slightly in there. All right, I, I went ahead and grabbed a uh, bright yellow just to see, right? I mean, he had a lot of room. He could have got pretty crazy. Maybe some of that exists down in here. Um, but anyways, you guys get the point of kind of that color harmony. Let's get rid of Charles. And let's go to one of my favorite living painters, Brent Cotton. You guys may know his work. Um, I'm gonna show you really quickly, all three of these paintings that you can see are all Brent's work. Um, but I, what I wanted to use, I could use either this one with the green sky purple or the one behind it, even though it's quite fuzzy, um, as the example of how he's gone between warm and cool palettes, hasn't he? I'm gonna fit it on screen. Yeah, look at those side by side, same artist completely different color palettes. Um, you know, and you can decide, is this one, uh, you know, all right, either of them really tonalist paintings? I think so, but I'm pretty lenient in what I consider a tonalist painting. Um, but his color harmonies in his paintings are just so beautiful and he can get pretty extreme at times and have really um, bright and, uh, you know, interesting contrast. But a lot of them are really quiet and muted. Um, I mean, this one's really simple, right? Purple and green. And just variations of them, little bits of warms in there. Let's look at this one. This one's a little more interesting as far as um, completion. I think they're both just absolutely beautiful. Um, but yeah, so obviously one is warmer, one is cooler, right? I don't have to really ask you which is which. They're really in your face. Um, he is very technical with his paintings. For the most part, he is getting looser in his uh, last couple of years. He uses a lot of palette knife nowadays. 
and a lot more paint. So if you want to go and explore his work, you can, Brent Cotton out of Montana. Um, and um, yeah, so just let's look at, let's even just change this to a black and white image, adjust, desaturate, right? It still really holds together nicely, doesn't it? It's, you know, he's letting the values do the work. Now let's kind of look at this and then think about where are his warmer colors are generally where it's a little bit lighter, right? And then it gets a little darker, especially when he's getting into, or cooler, when he's getting into his shadows. But his, war, his darks are still quite warm. If I pick up, I'm going to take that warm I just grabbed from over there, and I'm going to put it over here. This is this shadow color over there, but I'm going to put it on the cool painting. And that's uh, really dark. But can you guys see that? That that's actually a really, still really brown, quite warm. That's the color I chose down here. In the in his shadows, it looks very greenish and everything because it's next to the reds. So it's greener than the reds. But when you put it over here next to green, it's actually red. So color, just like temperature, is always about what it's next to and what color it's contrasting with. I'm gonna do the same up here, right? Let's go to the sky in this painting, right? See the blue up here? Very obviously a blue gray. Let's go ahead and grab a piece of that. And let's make the same thing. So that blue color that's over there, I just grabbed it. Why is it not doing it? Uh, okay. Now I'm going to fill over here. Anybody want to guess what color it's going to appear? Oh, orange. Yep, that's it. That is the blue in this sky. Wow. Let's put a square. <laughs> here there it is i just filled it how about the purple with the purple where's the purple in this one in that one upper uh left maybe or right above the highlight of the cloud or upper right kind of looks okay, so right up here yeah Okay, let's grab a little bit from there. And let's it does, see it does look purple. Yeah, let's see what happens when I put it on top of the purple. <laughs> Isn't that wild? Wow. Wow. So it's all about the colors, the values, the temperatures that it's next to. So cool. It's so interesting to me. And that's why you always have to test. You can mix all you want on the palette, but you have to test it on the painting next to the space. That's why having a bright white canvas can be really difficult for some artists. You know, that's why a gray might help because it helps you read your values. Um, and you, you almost have to get your painting kind of covered before you can really begin to judge. I don't understand artists who can start in one corner and work their way across the painting. For no, me, maybe it's not. always about, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's so crazy. It's, you, I mean, when you're out there with a group of plain air painters, you'll always hear somebody going, look at this color on the palette. Now look at it on my painting. It's totally different. And, you know, we're, these are people that have been painting for years and it still just blows their mind. I'm just going to put that same purple that we put down there. I'm going to put it up here next to the green and see what it looks like next to green. Let's see if it looks, yep, look at that, next to the green. That's the color that's down here. Now, what does it look like? Red, yeah, I saw, I read your lips, Michelle. It's reddish up here. I'm pretty sure it's still got the same color. I'm just gonna double check. That's crazy. Same color, let's try it here. <laughs> Let's 
So it still reads pretty same. It's a little appears actually a little darker there. But yeah, up here and next to the green. Let's put it next to bright green. <laughs> Oh, I just picked the whole scene. <laughs> <laughs> so, Michael, um, you you would call this green and purple painting a toneless painting, and and but it's I mean it's definitely I mean where I live, if I saw a sky that color, I'd be running for a tornado shelter, you know. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, it's an interesting color palette that he chose. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I would have been uh, brave enough to make it all green like that. But anyways, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't care, again, too much if it's tonalism. Um, you know, and I don't know if Brent Cotton calls himself a tonalist. Um, it is tonal. I mean, you know. Tonal, yeah. And it's, you know, it's green and purple. So it's, you know, they're not even really close on the color wheel. Um, makes you so think I, he I just wonder, tried, it, it makes it, you think he just tried the two colors, see if he could get away with it, you know? Yeah, I think all artists are trying to experiment. I'm gonna grab this green and I'm gonna take that over into his green over here. I mean, Michael, he off, you know. Hey, Michael, yeah. since, since you put that pinkish red on the green and purple painting, and I blow up the green and purple painting, I see that color next to the horizon. Yeah, I do too, right here. Yeah. yeah. And behind the trees, it's very interesting. Yeah, he definitely is letting some warm sneak through. And certain so what I wonder is um, the purple and the green and purple painting, how purple is it? I mean, is, is a lot of that purple a, a result of the green background? Or is it more, I mean, is it grayish purple or is it really purple purple? No, it's quite gray, but it appears. Oops. And, and without the green background, it might read more as gray. You're right. Let's do another experiment. Let's grab the purple. Let's take it over to here and let's put it on. So let's put that purple up next to the purple. Isn't that wild? Look how dark it is. Yeah. Let's put it over here. Now let's go warmer. Let's go to right to the warm spot, warm and light. Boy, one could spend hours with this. Right. I bet you it's going to appear almost black here. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, no. It just goes really blue with mm -hmm. orange around it. Yeah. How about how about if you put it way down in the dark foreground there? That's almost a purple shadow. Isn't that wild? Same purple. Green <laughs> spots. Look how dark it is up here, how blue it goes with all the orange around it, and then oh, down here, it actually reads yeah. closer to what I envision it being over on this painting makes us feel like we can't trust our own eyes. You literally cannot trust your own eyes. And yep. then when, when you're outside in plein air. One you know, of the things I do, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, even if you put it on your canvas, you're still not really sure what color it is because there's so much ambient glare. A hundred percent, yeah, everything. I mean, you know, you've been out plein air painting enough lately that when you bring a painting in, it's a whole different painting. A whole different painting. So our lighting often appears a lot darker because we're compensating for that super bright that's outdoor light. Um, that's what I love about the whole black and white acrylic underpainting is you go out and do that on plein air and you can see that pretty well. And then you come back to the studio and mess with the colors without the interference of the sun. Right, yes, exactly right. Um, Anyways, that was super fun. I mean, that is so crazy that purple, 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 uh, red, 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 and how different they appear or whatever colors we want to call those. Thank you, Brent Cotton, for letting us turn your artwork into pop art. Here's another one of his. This one, I mean, so this one still has the purples, greens, and reds, but I still consider this kind of tonalism. Um, but again, I'm just so lenient with my terminology when it comes to tonalism because I'm not going to buy a painting strictly because it's tonalist or not buy it, you know what I mean? Or 
I'm not right. attracted to paintings that are strictly tonalist. We're just kind of trying to use some of the things that they have learned in our paintings and uh, how we might use them. Um, this is Andrew Wyeth here. Um, I can make it fit on the screen. This is more like a little watercolor sketch. And uh, I just kind of wanted to bring up that Andrew Wyeth did a lot of sketching, just kind of like I just did up there, very tonal, some green. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's a whole bunch of them he's done like this. And, um, you know, he has some beautiful ones of his fences. He's a very dry brushing technique with his watercolor somehow. Um, I'm guessing he's painting out of the tube. And it's scratchy feeling, which is interesting for watercolors to me. But anyways, I just grabbed him because everybody knows and everybody loves Andrew Wyeth. He's, you know, he's so awesome. And, uh, you know, they're beautiful. These little kind of tonal sketches that he was doing. Um, this is a Russian guy named, I'm just going to call him Alex. Uh, <laughs> um, Alexander Leach. Kostinichev. I don't, yeah, I've never heard his name said out loud, but I do like his work. Um, I think I follow him on Facebook, actually. Um, and he does all sorts of different work. He's very Russian um, in his stuff. He has a lot of dark, dark paintings, but he does these beautiful tonal scenes as well. All right, very quickly, let's just kind of go through our things. Do you guys picture this more as the tight brushstroke or more expressive? expressive yeah. leans towards impressionism and everything else and it feels different to me than like we just looked at the bread cottons that were much tighter and uh representational and i like them both i like you know brent cotton's technical prowess and i like the spontaneity and impressionistic nature of this one um warm or cool this one's obviously leaning more towards warms in it and if we were to pick a color palette, I would say it's in the reds, even though there's a lot of greens. None of these greens are vibrant green, are they? There's, if I pick again, a vibrant bright green and put it on there, you know, we can see a lot of green on this painting, am I right? But let's find what area has quite a bit of green down here. I move this up to this corner so it stops appearing in the middle. Ta-da, so <laughs> red, right? So much red in those greens. Even if I try to match it value-wise with the darker green, just kind of a quick guess as far as values, fill, right? Those greens all of a sudden don't appear green next to it hardly at all. Um, so anyways, they're, it's very reddish. Those greens have been very strongly affected by the reds, the skies, you know, reddish. Um, the top of the sky, what color? Let me get rid of these darn bars. Um, what color would you call the top of that painting? Green. It's pretty green. Pretty green, yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a reddish brownish. Reddish, brownish, a little greenish. He probably has the green underneath that he's kind of covering up, doesn't he? And he's kind of bringing over the lighter colors. Um, you can see some darker areas. Um, yeah, I don't really know what to do, but to show us, um, well, let's just kind of zoom in. I'm going to go ahead and crop just part of the sky. Uh, this is just part of the sky and let's just zoom in. So there's kind of the color patterning between the dark, the little bit greener and the little bit redder. If we squint our eyes, it's a little bit darker at the top, but not much. He's keeping his values pretty close. The light and the dark stay pretty similar. All it's doing is really getting a little bit warmer, a little redder towards the bottom and a little bit greener towards the top. But when we look at his painting, it's pretty severe. Like you can definitely feel the light going away from the, the light source, right? So anyways, good example of a lot of things in that painting. Um, I don't really care for this painting too much. I thought it was just kind of a, it was one of the first ones I grabbed just because I saw it. And you know, and it's just very expressive um, brush strokes, very loose gestural. I imagine, I hope this was a fairly kind of quick painting 
Um, and I don't know the artist's name, so I'm going to get rid of that one. It had the gray and it had the cool and the warm. It did. You're right. Yeah. Let's look at this Francis Murphy. So we have a whole different color palette. What palette is this? What color fam, uh, color hue? Green. Green. Yeah. Nice and obvious. Everything stays within the green. Even the reddish colors in this tree. Let's grab a little part of it. Um, are, I can just grab it and pull it across, are quite green. Right? So that's what appears to be red over there. Wow. Um, you know, let's put it over here on top of this bright green, brighter green, and let's see how it'll probably appear quite red against that. Damn it. Um, edit fill. Wish there's a shortcut for the fill button. Yeah, I mean, a little redder, a little lighter. Um, and then if we want to talk about, you know, the quickness and the kind of this definitely got kind of a more poetic brush stroke, especially when you look at the tops of the trees. There's actually two figures in here. You can barely make them out. One walking looks like his head's down. It's pretty sad. Can, can you blow that up? Oh, yeah. I, I think it's a figure. It could be just a post. I don't know. And I always thought <laughs> that this was a figure also looking down. It's like two sad people <laughs> walking <laughs> behind the bushes. I don't know. Uh, I guess peasants were. Looks like a fence, uh, fence rail behind it. So oh, maybe. Oh, maybe you're right. I now I see that dark line could be the fence post going behind that tree. Isn't that funny? All the times I've seen that painting, I've just assumed it's a sad person. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. It could be a fence that's literally connected to this tree. I guess. Strange. I don't know. I'm not gonna worry about that. Anyways, green family, cool key right everything's pretty cool even these warms i mean they're warmer you got a little bit of brown down there or reddish on the barn down there but um again if i pull up you know if if it was one of us and we we're out there painting and we uh saw a red barn and you're like okay i know what red looks like right it wouldn't work like what happened to go I think somebody's rubbing up against their microphone there. Oops, sorry. Yeah, look at that bright red that I grabbed next to. Now all of a sudden this barn doesn't even appear red anymore at all. Um, so it really matters keeping them in the family, keeping them related and keeping that harmony. That's what I mean by harmony. So, you know, I could have a green scene with a red barn, but if I didn't want it to be super garish and you know completely the the um focal point like if i put this red in there try not to look at it right now right it's almost impossible your eye goes right to it like it's just you look away for a second and your brain's like nope we're looking at this pink thing because it's so crazy um so just be aware of that if you've got things in your painting that are drawing too much attention unnecessarily then they're not in harmony. And that could be the values. Your, your values could be off. It could be too bright or too dark, right? I can do the same thing where I can just, uh, I can put something that's just out of place, just too light in the same way, right? All of a sudden, look at that. That's just so out of place. And that's not even white. That's still pink. Um, same thing I could put, Something that's just too dark in the painting, right? It's just too dark. He doesn't have that dark anywhere in his painting, right? So we just can't look away. This painting is now about these things, right? It's not about this sad man holding up a fence over here. <laughs> um, anyways, so that's kind of what I mean by harmony. Are things playing nicely together? Um, something I hear artists say is how much can the painting bear? How much can it carry? Can it carry this much dark? Not currently. Can it carry this much light? Not currently. Could I have this vibrant, vibrant color in it? Not currently. I would have to go through and change things dramatically. I could come in and adjust the contrast 
and so that my darks get a lot darker, right? And my brights get a lot brighter. And now, ignoring this pink color, these things can work, right, in the painting. That's so, it's so interesting. So you're establishing your value key. This is a very much a, let me get back to the beginning. And I did a lot of mean things to that painting. All right, there we go. You fit on screen. It's very much mid values, isn't it? If I put up a value scale on there, it's very much in the mids. There's no brights and no darks, just like we looked at, right? Um, it's very much in the green key. And it's very much in the, I think, kind of cooler key as well, right? So there's harmony within this painting. Whether or not you find it interesting is beside the point. You know, it might drive you batty or be the most boring painting you've ever seen. Um, I won't tell J. Francis Murphy. Don't worry. Um, but it is what it is. He created it in a value key. He created it in a color key. And he created it in a temperature key all to create the feeling that it is that we get from this painting. Okay, so just be aware of that as we're going forward. I'm gonna start going a little faster, obviously. Warm, what's the color key, do you think? Red. Yep, kind of earth red, brownish, right? If we wanna to go to the outside of the color wheel, yeah, I would say it's mostly orange red. Um, if, as we go in the color, in towards the middle of the color wheel, we can get towards the more specific browns and different things. Does have a couple of splotches of green. He does have a higher contrast with the darker dark and probably a little lighter light than the last painting we just saw. But, but what's that fence post doing right in the middle of the stream? Oh man, it looks like it lost the thing across the top. What is going on? Let's see this sad person. I like that this person has their purse. Yeah, it's interesting. They loved having one or two figures in their paintings. That was really, really common in them. I think it was meant to um, kind of our place in nature and contemplation. Um, Leonard, Le uh, Leonard, I'm sorry, Leonard Ackman. Um, I see quite a bit of work by him. Definitely had it, an impressionistic brushstroke, very much a directional brushstroke. If we zoom in, let's go ahead and blow this up. Fit on screen. Um, look at the, all the background is sideways brush strokes. All the trees are diagonal brush strokes. The trees in the foreground are vertical brush strokes. Uh, kind of interesting what he was borrowing from the impressionist, um, but still uh, tonalist, uh, the warm underpainting. We can obviously see that where he left the paint showing around the outsides. Um, what do you think, though? This is a tough one, right? It's got the warm underpainting, but I consider it a cool painting still. It, it's predominantly. It does look, look cool. What makes it cool? The grays. It's covered in gray color. Uh, All those warm, yeah. covered in gray. And that's, this is, you know, I don't love his brushwork particularly. I think it's fun and it's interesting. I, you know, wouldn't mind experimenting with that. And maybe some of you, that's really cool and interesting. And that's awesome. Um, but I do love having my warm underpainting and my cooler colors on top. That is something I use all the time. In fact, mm -hmm. even when I went out painting this last weekend, I did one, my biggest painting, I just left it as a warm burnt umber or earth red underpainting um, with, and I'm looking forward to getting back in and covering it. I'll show it to you when we get back to the stop cream. Oh, I can do it now. Do a stop share real quick. And hi, everybody. So I can show you the difference. So I did, I don't know, a number of little paintings out in the vineyards this weekend. So this is not the one I was just talking about. This is just straight color. Um, it was a very overcast. Huh, it's reading as warmer. The top is actually quite gray. But anyways, that's a colored version of kind of me trying to capture it. This is like a little half hour quick sketch just trying to capture the idea of the atmosphere. And then after that, I had another half hour to do another quick little painting. And I just decided, you know what? Screw the color, let's go for the design and values. Um, and I, I was just taken with the patterning of the farms and the fields. So that's all I looked for was just design. And now I can, you know, after this dries a little more, 
Um, I can come back in and color those up just like our buddy Leonard over here. Right? So I can do that same thing. I can do it with grays. I can do it with greens, whatever colors I choose for my fields and my scene to be. So any questions or comments on that, on this painting? Nope, cool. Um, wait, I, I, don't, I don't have my video on. Oh. Question, <laughs> your painting was, what did you say that was a warm underpainting? Yeah, it's primarily earth red with a touch of um, French ultramarine to make it darker. And uh, a little bit of white in the sky, but this, it started to actually rain. So I kind of wrapped it up um, this is as far as I got. But yeah, it was primarily earth red. And I used a fast matte paint um, by Gamblin that's pretty much dry to the touch already, even though I painted that on Sunday. Um, well, that's beautiful. Will you <clears throat> continue to show us the painting as you make your changes? You'll know if I'm happy with it if I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I get it. I get it. Sure. Yeah, totally. I'm doing a lot of paintings in this kind of similar way. When we go back to when you can see me again, you'll see a big red one behind me. Um, and that one will be cooled down. Um, anyways, let's look at Paul Ballmer. He's a living artist. Um, he uses a lot of texture. I don't know if he's using um, like those kind of brushes that literally have this um, stripes kind of built into them. But anyways, I just, this is a really cool example of just kind of a simplistic, beautiful scene very much in harmony it's greens and a little bit of kind of a brownie taupey color is that the right word um but it's really just kind of a green painting for the most part um i, I really like these colors i might steal these colors for that painting i just showed you right this would be a, a lot of fun um now being a university of oregon ducks fan maybe that's why i like this painting yellow i don't know um but i just wanted to show you about brushwork kind of, really expressive. It reminds me of Corot's colors. Yeah, for sure. I could definitely see that. Yeah. So Michael, would you call this a cool or warm? I would say very much on the cool side. Because even though there's yellows, those are cool yellows. Let's mm. grab a warm yellow. Who's this painter? His name is Paul Balmer, and he uses these stripes a lot in his paintings. He definitely tapped into something. Um, How do you spell the last name? B-A-L-M-E-R. I'm going to go ahead and just see. I'm going to put a square of bright yellow on it and see what happens. This is a pretty cool primary yellow that I'm about to fill in. So that's a, that's a primary yellow. Let's grab a warm yellow. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you could decide, you know, is it warm? Is it cool? Because greens are warmer than blues, you know, yellows are warmer than greens. Um, you can decide really, this might be kind of a mid temperature. There's a, there's a warm yellow. The sky still feels quite cool to me, even though it's kind of a, you know, it's on the warmer side. It's not on the blue side. It's kind of leaning towards red, but um, yeah, and you can kind of decide. The main thing is that he's kind of got a nice harmony in the piece, doesn't he? When I get rid of those squares. So anyways, just want to share that with you. Um, with Paul Batch, another living artist. Uh, I don't see as much from him anymore. He kind of used to see quite a bit of stuff from him. I don't know. Maybe I just stopped following him or something. Um, he does this kind of nice simplistic landscape stuff a lot of the time. Um, I really like his use of the reds and greens together. Um, so that's something that's really interesting to me as I paint more and more fields and right. Very, very consistent values, but it's got the reds and the greens in there. Hard to see, but anyways, save changes. No, uh, this is Renato. I don't know how to say his name, Mucilio, Mucilio, M-U-C-C-I-L-L-O. He shows in Washington, but I think he lives in Canada. Um, he does a lot of all sorts of really colorful paintings as well as, well, not really colorful. They're always, they always have beautiful, beautiful harmonies. This one's very limited. This is just kind of like what I was doing with the tonal, 
tonal tonal background um and he, he looks like the paint's really quite thin and then he came into the sky with uh thicker and more opaque paint love his work love it love it love it it's a little too tight and rendery for what i would want to do personally i like having a little bit of impressionist brush strokes in my work but i just adore his work it blows my mind all right everybody knows who this is right the great wolf con and i'm always amazed that he comes up in conversations about tonalism because i truly think of wolf con as very much a colorist um and uh yeah, he's an interesting artist, but um, this one was actually on a post about tonalism, and I can kind of see that. Um, it's very muted for some of his, you know, he's known for his big red barns and everything else. Um, but I thought I would bring, put, put this up. I thought it was a lot of fun. It's, I would say it's a cooler painting, lower on the uh, value scale, right? A little bit darker, but then you do have the bottom of it to break that up a little bit, a little bit brighter uh, ground plane, the grasses. And look how basic this is. I mean, we can still tell that it's some trees with maybe a hill behind it and some grass. And it really doesn't have much to it. It's just a couple pastel strokes, it looks like to me. Um, anyways, Wolf Kong, interesting artist, interesting painter. And now, some people are colorblind with purples and greens. He is? No, some people are, you know, purple and green is a, is one of the colorblind. Oh yeah, totally. Lots of men. And Cleveland mentioned in his book and he, he thinks that he's uh, a tonalist. I've always thought of him as a colorist also. And yeah. I went to Santa Fe once and saw an exhibit of his and boy, oh boy, was it ever color. <laughs> Maybe it's the values. Not tonal, you know. Maybe because the values are so close. Maybe, yeah, maybe even, I, yeah, I don't know. I would be curious to learn more about Wolf Kahn. Scott Galatly um, is a big fan of his work. Um, one of the teachers at OSA. So maybe I need to have him educate me more on why I should actually like Wolf Kahn more than I do. I, I, truly don't, uh, I don't usually see what the fuss is about. <laughs> um, that's just maybe a little too honest there, but uh, yeah, when I, when I lived back east, uh, he has a gallery, well, actually a gallery carries his stuff down in North Carolina. And so I saw originals and then he came in one day and I actually got to meet him. Oh, cool. Yeah, and it is fun to look at his stuff, you know, and I, yeah, it's interesting, I, but yeah, I don't know much about him. I, I haven't done much research when it comes to WolfCon, so. Um, anyways, let's look here really quick. I would say that this warmer, right? Even though it's darker, it's still on the warmer side. Um, I would say that the predominantly colors are the reds, because even the greens are really quite red. You know, the little batch through the middle is a little greener. I just love this painting. This is Michael Workman, W-O-R-K-M-A-N. And I really, really love his color harmonies and so many of his paintings. This is the only one I grabbed, but uh, he, uh, I would love to study with him at some point if I get the chance. Um, Ramona Youngquist, I think, studied with him a little bit. I could be wrong. I shouldn't be saying that on a recorded video here. Um, anyways, love his color harmonies. Um, whether or not people consider this tonalism, I again, I don't really know, um, but I sure like it a lot. I would love to do like I did with those little squares and select different colors from this and just see how they line up. Um, but I, I want to keep moving because uh, we got a lot of these. So maybe I'll set this one over here to this side and we can think about coming back to it. Um, I just grabbed the Maxfield Parish just to show you, you know, nobody considers Maxfield Parrish a tonalist, but, you know, he sure did do some very tonal, uh, monochromatic color, you know, paintings, and still had that Maxfield Parrish glow, even when they're so cold. And so, He's a colorist, correct? I would say so, yeah. He yeah. was very, very translucent layers. So he would do his underpainting, and uh, he, uh, I thought he was doing his underpaintings in black and white, but I've seen some unfinished paintings and they looked like they were in different values of blue and white. Mm -hmm. And when he added the color, those blues would shift to other colors. 
So imagine just sheet after sheet of transparent colors going over the top. Um, and so Maxfield Parrish, because he was layering these translucent colors, was making colors no other artist could figure out how to make, right? You couldn't mix the colors. They had to be laid on top of each other to create these different effects. Maxfield Parrish even had a blue named after him, Maxfield Parrish Blue, um, which is a very interesting translucent blue. Um, anyways, I just wanted to show you that. Uh, this is Mark Hansen. I used him as one of the... Uh, uh, references. I love these colors. I may even use these colors for maybe I'll even use these colors and uh, Michael Workman's colors or something as my two references for today. They're so different and so awesome, right? So sorry, Michael. Love um, so you would consider Parrish has the transparent layers for a colorist, but Wolf Kahn would be more, his is more opaque. Is that it? Are they stronger or? Yeah, and he, well, Wolf Kahn did a lot of pastels as well. Um, so you don't really do too much transparency with pastels, as far as I understand. Um, yeah, no, I think Wolf Kahn was very direct. I don't think he dealt with transparency at all. He was very direct. Um, Mark right, Hansen okay. here, also very direct painter. He's known as a plain air painter. So there's not transparency in here. He's just painting, you know, mixing the color and putting it on there. Thank you. What beautiful color harmony, right? It's just beautiful. You could decorate a beautiful big grand room just drawing different <laughs> colors from this. And uh, I think it would really look regal and royal and make you want to drink a nice whiskey in there and <laughs> throw a nice leather couch in there. And oh boy, that'd be rad. Um, so anyways, I just love the color harmony. Very cool, even, it's got, even though he's got reds in here, right? He's got reds, but it's still very cool. I would definitely say this is a blue-green, you know, color harmony for the most part, but it's, I mean, it has the peaches at the top. He's got the reds at the bottom, um, but they all play nicely together, right? That's something to ask. Are my colors playing nicely together? Are they getting along? Is it a happy family? And if not, is it because I threw in a disruptive color, disruptive family member, disruptive friend, uh, bad house guest, whatever term you want to use uh -huh. on purpose for attention, you know, an attention seeking color on purpose, right? Because even as yellow gets the focal point, right? It's the light, the it's the warmest, brightest color kind of next to the, I mean, the orange is probably warmer, but it's the lightest next to the kind of darkest area, at least as far as closeness to each other. It's not the lightest light next to the darkest dark, but it's the biggest contrast uh, in the painting. But it's still in harmony, right? That yellow is not as bright as it could be. It's not as warm as it could be. Um, right, he could have put this. warm yellow in there and wouldn't that be garish yeah. right and that's funny right as soon as i put that yellow in there the sun no longer appears yellow because it's got that to compare to hmm. now as your that's eyes amazing. go away from it and come back to it it's yellow again cool i'll pull this one aside just in case we want to use that as a color reference Lovely. And um, uh, this one says that it's Leonard Ackman, but it's not. Um, who's this one? Chauncey Ryder, R Y D E R. Um, I think he's an Australian. Was an Australian painter. I love his tree shapes. They're so crazy. Um, this one's not a great example. I think I have one more in here, um, but definitely kind of an Australian tonalist. Now Australia is kind of a naturally tonalist <laughs> place to paint a lot of it. Um, Anyways, I just grabbed that. I, I'm a big fan of Chauncey Ryder. I, uh, I look at his work quite a bit when I wish my trees had more personality and more dance and more movement. Again, not a great example of what I'm talking about, but we'll hopefully get to see that. Um, this is Kevin Corder. Um, I recently bought one of his paintings and uh, big fan. I actually have one of his painting videos that I should watch at some point. Um, 
I'm I, just like all the books I have. I like to get movies and get books and then forget to read them or watch them. Um, but I have the cover. I've looked at it a lot. Um, anyways, this is an interesting one, right? You look at it first and it's kind of, it's quite warm, right? It leaning towards the reds and the pinks and the oranges. But I would definitely say that he's cooled down all of those colors. So I don't really know whether or not to tell you this is a warm or a cool because it's all about what it's next to. You know, if we put it next to this um, Michael Workman, which is quite warm, then it's cool painting, right? Put it yes. next to this Mark Hansen. Now it's a warm painting. So everything is comparative. So you guys can decide if this is a warm or a cool painting. It's right kind of in the middle for me. It's got both. Um, Definitely on the uh, cool, uh, on the darker side of the uh, of the value scale, even this, except for probably the sun. Um, anyways, lots of fun. Uh, anything you want to poke point out? I love the sky. Let's look at that real quick, real a little closer. Same thing that we were talking about, right? that it's all about color transition between these pinks and these greens and temperature transition, but nothing about value transition. Watch what happens. So you can still see the green on the top and the pink on the bottom, everybody? Yes. Watch what happens when I turn it into a black and white. Flat as can be. Okay, so that is not about value. That is about color and temperature. So if you, you know, when you do your value studies, you know, or do your paintings in black and white, you can totally have lots of color in your same values. You just want them to be related. Okay, pretty cool. Thank you. Uh, James Abbott McNeil Whistler, very long name. Um, one of the most famous tonalists, one of the early tonalists. He painted very, very, very thinly. And he thought all painters should, as far as I could tell. Oh. Um, I respect what he's doing, don't love all his work, but I think I can learn a lot by looking at it. He often had the slightly warmer undertones and put cool colors on top, just like I like to do. Um, yeah, and he really um, wanted his paintings to be very quiet, very subtle, and very soft. Um, like. What was it called? Like whispers on glass or something like that. Like painted whispers on glass or some some saying like that. I can't remember. Anyways, Whistler, Henry Tannery, another just cool painting. Um, I like the brush strokes. Let me pull up and I want to get rid, get through these um, fun brush strokes. Right, they're not tight, but they really there's still a sense of detail. Interesting. Um, I just really like this design. How he's framing it. He's got the light source up above, but this figures being framed by the trees. It feels illustrative to me. Um, like you could see it in a Bible or something like it feels like there's something going, some story it's telling, but I really like it. Um, this is Fred Cummings, who I adore his brushwork. Um, I am in awe. This is not, you know, a super extravagant painting by any means, but all of his paintings feel loose, fresh, and like he had a good time doing them. Um, I think he's, I'm not going to say where I think he's from. Um, but anyways, it's definitely in the cool colors, definitely in the uh, darker value key, right? In the lower value key. Um, yeah, just a little bit of warmth in there. And it's still not that warm. He didn't go crazy and make those oranges bright, bright orange or the yellows really yellow. Everything is on the cooler side, kept it all keyed in. Fred coming, if you really want to look for some interesting and fun brushwork. I think, let me see when I blow it up. I think this is also one of his, but I'm not positive. Uh, I can't tell that if that says, his, if that's how he signs his name or not. But anyways, the brushwork in this just blows me away. It's so fun, so fresh. Um, so interesting. Love the color harmony as well with the purples and greens and even the little splashes of yellow all feel like they belong together, like they're in the same world. 
even though it's just a quick slapdash feeling painting. Um, I almost feel like there's a little girl down here. Like she's looking off to the left, holding a watering pot. This is her, where her neck is. <laughs> little arm right here. I don't know. I just saw that. Thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know who exactly I, I put down that Fred Cumming painted this one, but I'm not positive. So, oh, Michael. Hey, yeah. Michael, I, I can see Fred Cumming's name on the top of the slide. So is yeah, that, did you put I, that up there? Or did that come? I did. I'm just seeing the signature. Oh, okay. I'm not positive that that somehow it might, because that looks like a G, but I'm not positive. So anyways, if, if I'm wrong, sorry about oh, that. Okay. Um, but I just really like the brush strokes and things in there. So I would love for you guys to feel a little bit liberated in your brushwork this week as well, while you're working on the, uh, the color and temperature keys. And basically all I want is two, two paintings from you. You know, if you want to do more, fantastic. They can be as fast or as loose or as tight as you want. You can choose warm color keys or cool color keys. You can do red paintings or blue paintings, whatever it is you want to do. I just want you to think about those things, okay? Um, Emil Carson, um, I'm not gonna go through, spend too much time with this. Green, green color key. Um, this is Mike uh, Douglas Fryer, who I really like as well. He does a lot of scratching in and out of his paintings, um, very loose. Uh, I, I hear great things about artists going to his workshops and coming away really liberated with their brushwork and brush strokes. Um, I think he paints with credit cards and palette knives and all sorts of squeegees and different tools. So anyways, that's a lot of green. That is a lot of green. Yeah, Michael work or Douglas Fire, sorry. Not as scared to use a color. Here's a, another one of his. Often has horses in his paintings. But yeah, isn't it nice? I mean, you can tell where the focal point is, but everything else is just kind of barely hinted at. You know, it might not be your bag, but I thought I'd share uh, some of his work. Um, Douglas Fryer, if you really, uh, he, I don't know if he's an artist artist in a way, like I, I, he comes up a lot in conversation where people are just kind of like, man, what he gets away with, but how he pushes the envelope and, you know, how does he make that credit card make 20 crazy little splashy dashes and all of a sudden it's a tree. Um, David Grossman, uh, he shows in Oregon out in Bend. And, um, oops, wrong one. I very much like his kind of less is more attitude to his paintings. They're very poetic. Um, I, would, I would suggest going and looking at them and seeing what you think. I might have one or two more in here, but very much warm in this one and the, you know, golds and ochre colors. And uh, again, I just love the poetry. Um, I, it's interesting because sometimes I want details. Sometimes I want like how little can I convey and still get the most across just like a good poem, right? Um, and I, he, uh, he does some really beautiful stuff. And when I say less is more, sometimes you'll have a tree with a thousand, thousand brush strokes in it, but it's very, the subject matter is very simplistic sometimes. Here's another Chauncey writer. Um, again, not a great example of the trees and things, but um, in the kind of darker value, and I know I'm boring you guys, but this is too much, um, but warm color value kind of towards the reds and yellows. Charles Warden Eaton, another, look how green this one is, right? Little splashes of orange, very green, very dark, very cool. Or you could say it's warm too if you wanted. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's very dark and green. Same one, Charles Wharton Eaton. He loved his greens. Wow, we made it. That was a lot. Look at all those little bars down <laughs> below. Those are all paintings that we just looked at. Thank you guys so much. I'm gonna, I'm gonna swing these over just in case I wanna kind of look at them as color references. Um, as you can tell from my voice and scratchy throat, I do need to take a little break. It's 11 o'clock already. Holy cow. Um, all right, I either paint fast or class goes a little long. Again, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and um, and we take a 
You guys okay with a 10 minute break? Okay. Yeah. So yes. At 11.06, 11.05. And I will be painting on to the uh, paintings that we started. All right. <laughs>